All right. Uh, so you show up for your week one level one. You're teaching. Uh, what time do you guys show up? How do you make it work? Uh, I I aim to be before six thirty because you have to fill out all those forms and everything, and I kind of want to be down there saying seeing if there's anybody down there right at six thirty. But you show up even earlier. Right? I show up like forty five minutes before class starts yeah. because I want time to prep the classroom, to relax, and. Uh, prep my TA and all that stuff, and I don't want to be rushed. Uh, and then like, at the very beginning, there's always this awkward thing of like, are you a cafe customer or are you a level one student? And you just kind of have to ask people that and see, and it's kind of funny. And introduce yourself. Yeah. I think being down there introducing yourself early and then having your TA kind of hold that position as well mm -hmm. while you kind of run back and forth and do yeah. whatever else business-wise you gotta do. Yeah. Uh, pens and intake forms down there. The intake forms are important. We don't use the information a ton but it gives them a little task to keep their minds off of being nervous so right. please teachers use the intake forms make it happen have the stack down there mm -hmm. give them a mission so they're not just stressing out kind of not talking to other people in the coffee shop and feeling weird about it we did not talk about this earlier but i feel like intake forms are good the one question that i look at is what are you worried about or is there like what, some question mm -hmm. about what are you scared about what are you worried about and i look at that just to see if there's anybody that i can connect immediately and be like oh okay i know what this person needs i know what that person needs but it's like a super quick like you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. Oh, okay, this might be something that I want to watch out for. Totally. Uh, you want to start mostly on time. So if people are there, try to bring them up like at seven or a couple minutes after and then let them know that's what's going to happen. So keep them in the coffee shop. Say we're going to go up right at seven or a couple minutes after and then uh, bring them up pretty close to on time if mm -hmm. possible. The, uh, you should have a sign down there that says where you are so latecomers can find you. And then you may or may not leave your TA down there. What do you guys do? I s differ, yeah. Yeah, I send my TA down once or twice, five or ten minutes into class to kind of find any lost lambs. And I leave mine down there for like five, five-ish minutes and tell them to come up in a little bit. So that's, yeah. Cool. Once you get the students up there, uh, don't let them sit down. Have them set their stuff and then keep them moving. Like, uh, start with action. Please don't start with talking. Please don't start with some kind of check-in. Usually, about, like, everyone, okay, put your stuff down, everyone on your feet, find a partner that you didn't come here with in yes. five, four, three, yeah. two, right. one. I don't give them any time to think. Right away. And they're just up on their feet finding a partner, and then I give them something easy to do yeah. with their partner. Sometimes I'll start with balloon, and I'll just be like, okay. Like, as they're setting their stuff down, I just start throwing it in the air, and people will be like, oh, oh. Yo, know, I have to get that and then they'll come join the circle and then you get a circle pretty quickly that way. Yeah, I think big group thing, small group thing, doesn't really matter what it is as long as your mission is to get them out of their head, get them doing stuff instead of thinking about stuff, and keep it all super low pressure and not ask a lot of them. Um, yeah. And making it feel improvised. So if you can make it feel like you don't have a plan but you know things are going to be okay, and what about this? Yeah. Uh, Carrie, I liked your t-shirt thing where they have to like explain their... Yeah, I usually, yeah, I say, you know, like, just uh, find something in your pockets or something that you're wearing that you, uh, you, you can tell a story about. And I try to find something in the first 10 to 15 minutes that I mess up, and then I call it out, and I laugh it off so that they get a model. Even before we start getting into that more serious stuff, they have a model of, like, oh, messing up's okay here. Yeah, we've talked about uh, trying to make sure your TAs aren't, trying to be good like right. encouraging the TAs to be open to making mistakes and when you model a game with them having them not be great at it or not give great suggestions in yeah. that moment. Uh, I think your mission for the first kind of 30 minutes of class is just make sure they're having fun and that whatever anxiety or skepticism or fear they might have come into the space with you're helping them let go of it. That's the only job and then you can sprinkle some of the logistical talking points yeah once you've gotten through some of that. So I'll do bio after maybe two or three games. I'll be like, oh, by the way, I'm Andy. Uh, how do you guys bust out those talking points early on and what things need to get said? You know, I was thinking about this as you were talking. I feel like I like to wait until I see them really laughing, you know, because in the middle, beginning, they're kind of nervous. And once they've had like a couple of really good laughs, then I'm like, by the way, my name's Jessica. And I do my bio, I do um, quick, quick, uh, I, and sometimes I don't mention that I'm the owner because that, that feels like that's so much status right there that I sort of like just leave that for later. Um, introduce the TA uh, and then I will wait a little bit longer. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I do it all together. And then I'm like, the bathroom's over here. Please don't ask me to go to the bathroom, you're a grown up. <laughs> there are some logistics like we'll take a break halfway through class. Yeah. Uh, the first half of the class looks a lot like this. Everybody up on their feet. Second half, 
we'll sit down, we'll play some games and scenes in front of each other, we'll keep it super low pressure, but that's what the class will feel like. Uh, we're here for six weeks, um, but again, there are like six or nine, however many levels there are at the hideout, mm-hmm. by the time you're telling people about it. <laughs> uh, and that the first three levels are intro, and I hope everybody does them. I hope I get to keep you guys for mm-hmm. three levels of improv. And then if you decide you like this thing and you want to do more of it, then the levels four through six might be for you. And if you're fascinated by narrative, then maybe levels seven through nine. The spoiler alert, new curriculum programming coming. <laughs> Um, oh, at some point, we, uh, we want to have a few conversations with them. Mm-hmm. So what are those conversations, and when do you guys bust them out? So I'm, I'm different from Jessica because I tend to do it in the first half of class at some point where I, uh, I talk about creating a safe space for people to play in and trying to be uh, as inclusive as possible during that and also be kind to each other while we're learning how to create that space. So I basically say something like, uh, you know, because we're uh, exploring improv, we want to create a safe space for everyone to explore that. So we want to try to avoid stuff like bigotry or sexism or homophobia or anything like that. Um, and uh, and while we're doing that, because we're creating stuff off the top of our heads, we might screw it up and we might accidentally do something that's a little bit off uh, off base. And when we do, we'll gently call it out and we'll be kind to each other and forgiving. and. Uh, and try to figure out the, the best way to kind of move forward with it without uh, making anyone feel too bad about it. Something like that. Um, I, mine is very similar to his. I usually wait until after the break, uh, and then I have everybody sitting down after the break for a little bit. And uh, it's uh, my focus is like, we want everyone to have fun, not just some of us. So everyone wants to feel included. No one wants to feel like they're not a part of it. So we want to avoid, you know, blah, blah, blah misogyny what he said um, and then I do the same kind of thing about uh, but I'm like yeah sometimes you mess up and uh, sometimes something comes out of your head that you didn't even want to come out of your head and we're just gonna be like oops I didn't mean to say that or if somebody sees something that doesn't work for them you can be like hey that doesn't quite work for me and we'll just be all easy about it and understand that these are things that are just coming off the top of our head and move on from there well, I think another component of that is like a physical safety uh, component. So the thing that we've been saying before shows a lot now, I think uh, works really well in classes where uh, the if it requires consent in the real world, it requires consent in improv. So mm-hmm. there'll be a lot of uh, touching. Improv is a very physical format. That is to the degree of your comfort. If it's uncomfortable for you, you can step back and you can let us know in a moment. Uh, and beyond that, if you're going to be physical with someone, Make sure you get consent. So, you know, hugging and kissing and all of that are things that you, you look for consent in that moment. I actually wait. Okay, we didn't Ooh, talk about this earlier. Uh, I wait until we do people to people. Yeah. And when we're doing people to people, what I say, uh, because uh, most women have not been trained to say no, and it's kind of hard. Um, mm-hmm. So, instead, what I do is like, you know, we, we talk about people to people, we play that for a little bit, and I say, when you're on stage, you do that thing, you know, that you do in real life. If you're about to kiss somebody that you never kissed before, you kind of like look them in the eye and you come a little bit too close. And then you see, do they go back or do they come forward? And if you went back, I would back off too. I'd be like, oh yeah, no problem. But if you came forward, then I might give them a break. Oh, <laughs> I, that is a more complex conversation. I do save that conversation for later weeks. Yeah, I'm me not too. sure when exactly. Yeah. But I will sometimes say uh, the... Um, if it requires consent in the real world, yeah. it requires consent in improv. Uh, yeah. I'll say that in one sometimes. And I said, I say something like, generally the rule of thumb is don't touch anyone where you wouldn't touch like a stranger's child. It's <laughs> <laughs> very complex. I don't know, like, but like, so like a shoulder could be okay, a hand is probably okay, and beyond that, you're probably gonna ask yes. for, you're probably gonna ask. Okay, so like, because I feel like most people are, or pretty much everyone's okay with a yeah. tap on the shoulder or hands touching. Uh, Let's move on. We, uh, we don't have any good answers, I think, yet on the pronouns conversation, but Jessica, yeah. you had a good suggestion that I liked. Can you talk about that? When I do introduce myself, I tend to say uh, my preferred pronouns are she, her, but I don't tell other people that they have to say that as well. So then people can decide if they say it or if they don't say it, and that's their option rather than me telling them to. Great. Uh, you should mention while you're having this conversation that there's a code of conduct that we'll send to them and ask them to sign that includes kind of a lot of these things. Mm-hmm. And then but beyond that... When does that get sent out? Uh, between weeks one and two, usually. Okay. That's when I've been sending it out. 
Uh, and I, during that safety conversation, I do mention that they should approach me or my TA right. if anything, if they're feeling anything that they want to talk about in any way, and they should not feel afraid to do that. And then I segue from there. If you don't want to talk to either of us, I give them options. Uh, I usually mention the owners, and I was scolded by Andy to also mention him. What? <laughs> the scolding <laughs> in, in any way yeah. as scoldy uh, as he um, ever gets I think that it, I it's say, yeah go ahead Jessica. I would say make sure to mention me just because I'm the only female in that room and so that might be easier for some people yeah just give them the chain of command say if you don't feel comfortable talking to us you can talk to the education director mm -hmm. or you can talk to any of the owners yeah. and I mentioned that those uh, all those people are contactable through the website yeah. so that way they know how uh, they're also all listed in the code of conduct as well. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The uh, in week one, have fun is kind of the big priority, mm -hmm. and again, we are trying to set that tone. Yeah. So we have some debrief moments throughout. When do you guys hit those? Right before break, and then right at the end of class are the two times I debrief. Right before, like at the end of class, we'll do that, and then like a words of wisdom or whatever our closing thing is. I actually have a one also another one. So like the first forty five minutes of class is sort of like real fun, like silly silly stuff and then there's like a little bit of a turn to more exercisey stuff and I usually have them do a debrief right there but I can't remember what I usually use I'll uh, debrief uh, failure bow but uh, kind of uh, midstream kind okay. of the first half so that'll often be my big debrief there it's like uh, yeah, what do you well point? actually no I talk about um, are you planning and premeditating I'll have them kind of check in about yeah. that and then I'll bring failure bow in pretty quickly after that Sometimes I'll debrief failure bow and see if it's something that they can apply in the real world. But my big debrief is at the end of the first half, I say, um, what gets in the way of you having fun? Like, mm -hmm. what are the things that, that might limit your fun? Yeah. And I hope that that gets them talking about improv in a more life skills way mm -hmm. without me having to lecture about it. Yeah. And also it helps them hopefully have more fun in the second half because they can consciously approach yeah. that thing that's stopping them in yeah. a way that might be useful. Yeah. yeah, and then at the end of the second half, I say, "What was fun for you today? What things? What games do you like best? Or what could you steal immediately and start using it in your real life? Yeah, kind of this mm -hmm. week, tomorrow." I think there are times when I say, "Like out of this class, what excites you mm -hmm. for the rest of the? What are you looking forward to now?" Cool. Um, we talked about uh, encouraging people to hang out and get that social mm -hmm. aspect going on. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have best best practices? Yeah, what I usually do is say, I can't hang out tonight, whether I can or not. I say, I can't hang out tonight. You guys are welcome to, but I will hang out next week. So let's, everybody who, you know, make sure that you're available so we can all hang out next week if you want to. Very cool. I usually set expectations pretty, like, literally that day about how often I'm going to go out after class with them. And I let them know it's nothing personal. It's just me being an introvert. And that, uh, so I would like to hang out with them all next week. They should be hanging, like they, yeah. they should be welcome to hang out whenever. And so if anyone wants to go out today, yeah. set a place and I bet you'll get some people to hang out with you. And then I usually leave the social media group stuff until week two, just because I want them to actually want to hang out with each other. You know, after a while they'll be like, oh, or they might have actually even started some of that themselves. And then week two, we make it more official. That's what I do. Oh, I do week three is the Facebook week for me because that's the get connected week. Oh, that so makes sense. That's when I, so I, the first two weeks we go without social media and then we make the Facebook page between weeks two and three and get them all on board in week three. Cool. Any final thoughts about week one and making sure everybody's having as much fun as possible and not worrying about a thing? Uh, I think the main thing is just that you need to be delighted. If you're delighted in the class and delighted in what you're doing, then that, uh, then that calls forth delight in the students and and also you have a lot more fun so i think that's my main thing that i do is like get into a place like that's part of what i do before i come in it's like oh i just take a few minutes to be like oh this is gonna be great like i fucking love fucking love teaching level one and i really remind myself how awesome it's gonna be and then i'm in that place of just like come on guys let's do this oh. I usually tell, like, uh, I, at some point in the first week, I usually tell the story of how I'm still friends with people who were in my level one class, mm -hmm. and that, um, that you know, look around you. These, these people might be really good friends of yours a few months from now, so why not start, uh, you know, taking care of each other now and treating each other like friends now and, and let those friendships build, something like that. Uh, and that kind of helps set up that, that bonding experience that I want them to have throughout the levels. Love it. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.
Bye, hideout teachers. Bye, hideout teachers.